We're going to read from Habakkuk, Habakkuk chapter 2. Uh, we, have, we have studied our way through 2.5, and we'll pick up now in chapter 2, verse 6. Shall not all these take up their taunt against him with scoffing and riddles for him and say, Woe to him who heaps up what is not his own, for how long? And loads himself up with pledges. Will not your debtors suddenly arise and those awake who will make you tremble? Then you will, be, you will be spoiled for them. Because you have plundered many nations, all the remnant of the people shall plunder you. For the blood of man and violence to the earth, to cities and all who dwell in them. Woe to him who gets evil gain for his house to set his nest on high, to be safe from the reach of harm. You have devised shame for your house by cutting off many peoples. You have forfeited your life. For the stone will cry out from the wall and the beam from the woodwork respond. Woe to him who builds a town with blood and founds a city on iniquity. Behold, is it not from the Lord of hosts that the peoples labor merely for fire and nations weary themselves for nothing? For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Woe to him who makes his neighbors drink. You pour out your wrath and make them drunk in order to gaze at their nakedness. You have filled, you will have your fill of shame instead of glory. Drink yourself and show your uncircumcision. The cup, of the, Lord, the cup in the Lord's right hand will come around to you and utter shame will come upon your glory. The violence done to Lebanon will overwhelm you, as will the destruction of the beasts that terrified them. For the blood of man and violence come to the earth, to cities and all who dwell in them. What prophet is an idol when its maker has shaped it, a metal image, a teacher of lies? For its maker turns its own creation. For his, its maker trusts in his own creation when he makes speechless idols. Woe to him who says to a wooden thing, awake, to a silent stone, arise. Can this teach? Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, and there is no breath at all in it. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. This is the word of the Lord. Do you remember Jesus said, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? You know it's possible, right? Maybe not literally gain the whole world, but gain a whole lot in this world and forfeit his soul. You know, it's possible. The reason I bring that up is we need to remember that just because God uses someone, letter, this, this wonderful gift from the Lord, will be a come to our senses type of work from the Lord. God can use whomever he wants to use. And I hope that's really good news to you. To Habakkuk, it wasn't. He was perplexed by God using these wicked Chaldeans, these Babylonians. But I think it's important for us to pause because so often we think because we're prospering, God is for us for good. But what we know is God used a wicked nation precisely because they were wicked to bring about his good and glorious plan. So his using them was not approval. His using them was not affirmation that they were right and righteous. And so often, we will justify all sorts of non-biblical attitudes and efforts and point to the success as evidently God is happy with me. Think of how many churches are large in number and they have all sorts of fancy facilities. They have worldwide impact. And they don't even believe the gospel anymore. It's pragmatism. If I do this thing and God seems to give me the outcome that the, that the sinful natural desire of my heart would want apart from him, God must be in that. God must be affirming. God must be blessing. God may use you. He may greatly use you. But that does not mean you're trusting in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation. I'll say that again. God may use you. He may use us. But that doesn't necessarily mean you, we, are trusting in Christ alone. Again, we may have worldly success. That doesn't mean we're right or righteous. 
Habakkuk looked out and waiting for this vision. We, we left him in chapter 2 sitting on this wall waiting for the Lord to speak, waiting for the Lord to finish his speech and act. As God began to speak, it deeply troubled him. But as God continued to speak, it brought incredible clarity. And it will be a word of encouragement to us. This pronouncement of these five woes will be a, an encouragement to us if we're humble. If we're not humble, this can be offensive. It can wound us. It can wound our pride. But if we're humble, we're thankful for the warning. What, what God was doing, I think it says, yeah, what God was doing to, in this moment is he had revealed he was going to use the bitter and hasty Chaldeans for a moment. And he was announcing to Habakkuk, to you, to me, to anyone who has ears to hear, he is still just. He's just. So don't, don't define the Lord in a moment. Trust the Lord for who he is. And he is just. So as I said here, we just read this. God pronounces five woes on these Chaldeans. Five woes of what it means to not live by faith. And in pronouncing the five woes, he gives us five examples of what it looks like to not live by faith. And the reason I say these are five examples of not living by faith is because of verse 4. And the Lord is speaking there and he says, the righteous shall live by his faith. So he's calling Habakkuk out of this moment of complaining and concern and doubting. And he's saying, no, 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 my people, the righteous will live by faith. That is the one who is righteous by faith shall live. And then he points now to the Chaldeans and he woes them for their actions. He pronounces a judgment. You know, the word woe is the opposite of the word blessed or blessed. And so you think of the times that the Lord said, blessed are. This is a time in which we read, woe to him who is. We know what blessed or blessed means. Do you know woe means doom? Like doom? Certain doom? It is the opposite of blessed? The favor of God? It is the condemnation of God. So these five examples of not living by, by faith are are things we need to consider because they live today. These tendencies still live in our hearts. These actions are manifest in our lives. And we need to read this slowly and consider these things. What does it look like to not live by faith? I like to point to the positive, but every once in a while we need to point to the negative. So hopefully this ministers to us, gives us alignment with his heart. Lois, go ahead and bring up, if you can, all five of these woes or all five of these examples here. And uh, you'll see as we work through them, there's overlap. You'll also see that I'm taking 15 and 17 last, and hopefully that makes sense here in just a moment. But the first one we see in verses uh, 6 through 8, this first example of not living by faith, not trusting the Lord, is what I've called selfish ambition. Again, there will be overlap in these. So it's not that this is the only moment of selfishness. This whole thing is full of selfishness, but I just want to highlight that one aspect of verses 6 through 8. So we read, Shall not all these take up their taunt against him with scoffing and riddles for him? And so what, what he's saying is there's irony here. There's mockery happening here. You think you got ahead with this? Ironically, it brought your ruin. That's what God is doing with these woes. So again, in verse 6, Woe to him who heaps up what is not his own for how long and loads himself up with pledges. Will not your debtors suddenly arise and those awake who will make you tremble? Then you will be spoiled for them. Because you have plundered many nations, all the remnant of people shall plunder you for the blood of man and violence to the earth, to cities and all who dwell in them. The Babylonians were consumed with self-interest. They did what they did because they were selfish. They would stop at nothing to get more land for themselves, more power for themselves, more influence, more wealth, more ultimately more security for themselves. They didn't care who you were. They were going to take it. They didn't care what it cost you. They were going to take it from you. So in verse 6, woe to him who heaps up what is not his own. I know it belongs to you, but I'm stronger than you. It belongs to me now. Might equals right in the Babylonian heart. 2.8 says, because you have plundered many nations. They weren't great diplomats. <laughs> They're not coming in to bargain. They're coming in to announce it's mine now. 
If they wanted it, they took it. Now, if we stop at that point in history, we would probably join with Habakkuk in being royally confused, being, being brokenhearted, maybe even being mad at God, living in, in despair, in hopelessness. But God reveals their end, doesn't he? He reveals what's coming to them. And he reminds us, and this is so important for all of us, not just remember this, but sit in this, live in this. God is just. He is. He is just. And we need, to, we need to trust that. We need to place all of our weight on that singular truth. He's just. The world appears to be getting ahead. Those that are against Christ and his people appear to be getting ahead. And oh, they are getting ahead for a moment. So we read in verse 7. Will not your debtors suddenly arise and those awake who will make you tremble? The Babylonians come to town. People would tremble. But God says there's a day coming when those that you oppress, they're going to make you tremble. Then you will be spoil for them. Verse 8, because you have plundered many nations, all the remnant of the peoples shall plunder you. This is the irony in God's plan. The Babylonians got ahead for a while. But what? Not forever. The Babylonians were rich, comfortable, safe. Secure for a while, but not forever. The irony comes in because the measure they used was used against them. You reap what you sow. Do you believe that? You reap what you sow. So it's tempting. And I know the struggle to read Old Testament prophecy like this, what we call the minor prophets that were written 2,500, 2,600, 700 years ago. Some strange name, Babylon, Babylon, some strange name, Habakkuk, all taking place in time and space and think, what does that have to do with me? I know that tendency. Let's get to the New Testament because that applies to me. But friend, do you realize this is a timely word for us as well? Let's not dismiss it as relevant just because we're not the Babylonians and just because we've never killed anyone for selfish gain. Because every one of us knows what it is to be selfish, don't we? Every one of us knows what it is to take from others. What well, doesn't belong to us. But we took it anyway because it benefits us. We know what it is to look out for our own interest. See, the one that walks by faith is the opposite of this. That is, we're generous. We don't take. We give. And give. And give. And expect nothing in return. Because it all belongs to the Lord anyway. The one that we're following. We serve. Just because it benefits somebody else, we serve. And we don't expect anything in return, including praise and recognition. Because we say, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name be all the glory. Like this whole life culminates in Christ being exalted and we are forgetting one another. What a day of rejoicing that will be when we are free from ourselves and free from caring for ourselves and freeing and wondering, are they ever going to praise me and acknowledge me again? We will be free in the presence of the Lord forever exalting in him, exalting him, exalting in him. I hope you long for that day when you have truly died to self and live forever. You're free when you forget yourself. That's what Jesus bought for us. He freed us to serve. He freed us to be generous. He freed us to be kind and gentle. But I think there's an interesting reality here that we want to take back to 2-3 and see in light of what we just read. The judgment of God is sudden. You remember 2-3? For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, what? Wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. But then here in 2.7, will not your debtors suddenly arise? Which way is it, God? Does it seem slow or will they suddenly arise? And, it's, and I would say it depends on which perspective you have. If you're waiting on the Lord, doesn't it seem slow? How long? But if you're rejecting the Lord, I promise you it will be swift. He will call you to give an account at a moment you're not ready. And so we sit here now in this moment with the option 
Are we going to wait upon him? Or are we going to reject him and take matters into our own hands? Did you wake up today saying today may be the day that I get caught? Today may be the day that the Lord calls me to give an account. Today may be the day that I see the Holy One of Israel. Is that a reality to your heart? I saw just this morning that a man about, about five years younger than me, a former classmate, companion, died last night. Pulled over the side of the road, helped a car, an 18-wheeler hit him and killed him. Wife, two kids, life over. He's got a church that met this morning without him to announce their pastor died in the night. Is that reality to all of us? The Lord may call us today to answer, to stand before him. To which I have to say, friend, are you trusting him alone? Again, just because God has used you, it doesn't mean you're right or righteous. Are you trusting in Christ alone today? Not just for your salvation in eternity, but so your, for your salvation, your sanctification right now to work this thing out. Are you trusting him alone? That is the will of the Lord for all of us. We'll move on to verses 9 through 11. We're going to speed up here. Fear and coveting. Fear and coveting. See if this makes sense to you. Woe to him, verse 9. Uh, so we're in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 9. Woe to him who gets evil gain for his house to set his nest on high, to be safe from the reach of harm. You have devised shame for your house by cutting off many peoples. You have fortified your life for the stone will cry out from the wall, the beam from the woodwork respond. The Babylonians did what they did because they loved themselves. Amen? I hope you would say Amen. They did what they did because they wanted more for a reason, though. They did what they did to protect themselves. They had selfish ambition. They were looking out for themselves. That's why then they looked out at what you had or what the, the nations had and said, I want that. So I think we know that. What's surprising to us, though, when we think about history, when we think about their, their military might and their influence, what's surprising is the Babylonians did it because they were afraid. Did you know that? The bully didn't look like he was afraid. He looked bad. He looked tough. He looked strong. But look at verse 9 right here. Woe to him who gets evil gain for his house to set his nest on high to be safe from the reach of harm. Why did they do what they did? Fear fueled their desire for more. They were afraid of somebody coming in and taking them. They had seen the, the, the history and how nations rise and fall. And they were afraid they too would fall. And so they did what they did. They beefed up their military. They walked in as bullies because they were afraid that maybe a badder army, stronger army is going to come along. And we're going to proactively flex our muscles and hurt the nations so that people are intimidated by us. You know that's a bully, right? You know what motivates so many bullies is fear. Fear of being known. I, I see this more often in men than women. Okay, just full disclosure, men, we can talk about this later. Ladies, you can pray for us insecure men. I see so many men who are so, I mean, it's like they built their whole lives on this, on this sandy foundation of insecurity. And they've been hurt somewhere along the way. And they are firmly committed. Nobody's ever going to hurt me again. And so they proactively hurt people instead of letting people close to them because they're afraid of what people will say and think when the, when the people, when the person truly knows that man. I see it over and over and over again. The bully is afraid of being known. So he or she proactively will hurt to intimidate, to keep away. Aren't you glad Jesus is never a bully? <laughs> Aren't you glad that he is peace? He's not fearful. He's not fearful of you hurting him. Is that not incredible? He's not afraid of you knowing him. Is that not incredible? He's not afraid to love you and your insecurity. He loves you. I was reminded this week that um, 
everything apart from God and His Word breaks down the closer we get to it, the more we, we really study it and meditate on it. Um, so uh, I'm sure that some of you still uh, really think highly of me and think, you know, I do have a sin nature, but it's pretty small and insignificant. Nonsense. <laughs> Just come stay in my home for 24 hours. The closer you get to me, the more you're going to see the insecurity that lives in my heart, the sin that remains. You think of the philosophies of this world, the world the worldview that so many live by. The more you study it, the more it breaks down. But the more you study the Scriptures, the more cohesive it is. And the closer you get to God, the more wonderful He is. We've judged Him from afar. Again, His love must not be any better than my love or things that we say and think and feel. But the closer we get to the Lord, the more tender He gets. The more tender he, uh, we realize He is the more wonderful he is. The Babylonians were anti-Christ. They did what they did to be free from harm, so they took. They took to be safe. The irony of sin is it promises one thing but delivers the opposite. So they were setting up their homes thinking it would protect them and provide them safety, but they were actually bringing about their own ruin. 2.10 says, you have devised shame for your house by cutting off many peoples. You thought cutting off many peoples was going to provide you safety. No, no, no. It brought shame. You have, for, uh, you have fortified your life. For the stone will cry out from the wall. The beam from the woodwork respond. The very things that they coveted, the very things that they took, would eventually testify against them. Don't raise your hand. Don't shout it out. But I'm wondering, have you ever stolen anything? Have you ever taken something that wasn't yours? Maybe that's a more respectable way of asking. And then when you looked at it, it spoke to you. I'll never forget, 1988, I was 13 years old. 1988, I was 13 years old. I'll just let that minister to you for a minute. <laughs> and um, I stole a 1986 Fleer Jose Canseco rookie card from my cousin. I didn't know the Lord. I knew Jose Canseco was the best player in Major League Baseball that year. And I know my cousin had the card and she didn't know what she had, so I figured I'd take it. <laughs> and though I didn't know Jesus, every time I looked at that card, it said something to me. You're a thief. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. So you know what it's like when you put your hope in something and all it does is talk back to you. What you think is going to give you hope only leads to further shame. God says that's the actual life of the Babylonians, Habakkuk. They present themselves as strong and secure and prosperous. No. No. And God is saying that's the life for all of us who live in fear and take what's not ours. We bought by the blood of Jesus, live in faith, and we trust Him. And we remember sin lies to us. Underhanded way promises advancement and peace and security. Sin is a liar. It brings ruin and sorrow. Which I think flows right into this next portion, how we use people. The, next, the, the third example of not walking by faith is using people. Let's read this again, beginning in verse 12. Woe to him who builds a town with, uh, with blood and founds a city on iniquity. Behold, is it not from the Lord of hosts that peoples labor merely for fire? Nations weary themselves for nothing? To which we would say, no, that is not from the Lord. Verse 14, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. We who walk by faith, we bless and serve, we encourage and we build up. But those not living in faith build themselves up, oftentimes at any cost to those around. So Babylon was a truly magnific magnificent city. It was spectacular. The king's palace was the envy of all kings. In fact, one of the wonders of the ancient world was in the city of Babylon, this thing that they called the Hanging Gardens. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar's wife got homesick, and it's, 
you got to remember, it was probably pretty hard to build a garden, a, a green garden in the middle of the desert. But when you have enough money and you have enough might, you can do it. And so what we in history look back on is one of the, the seven wonders of the ancient world. And we have a curiosity about or an awe about what we need to remember is the problem was it looked spectacular, but it was not spectacular. It was built by slave labor. So what I'm saying is, though it was appealing to the eye, God was telling the Babylonians that their beautiful city would be brought to nothing. Everything they put their hope in would only be fuel for the fire of God's judgment. A nation built by slaves. Beautiful, spectacular, envy of all that saw it. Built by slaves, built by forced labor. So what the world envied, God said is shameful. That's a sobering word. Can you think of a nation built on the backs of slaves that many have envied? You realize one slave, one person, is more valuable than any business, more valuable than any city. Any state, any nation? Do we remember that? Because that's the heart of God. People are made in the image of God. They matter to God. I remember years ago being in New York City. And um, I know not everyone here loves cities. And not everyone loves New York City. And that's okay. God made us all a little unique, a little different. That's wonderful. But I remember being in New York City for that first time, and I, I just expected Spider-Man to come swinging through the streets. Because that's like the only time I'd ever seen something like that was in Spider-Man. We were swinging through these buildings. And I would just stand there and look, because I'd never seen anything like it. Just it was perfect squares. You could see the sun setting on the west side and so forth. And I'm just mesmerized. Then you go up to Times Square, and I'm just blown away. And then you go see Yankee Stadium, even though it was New Yankee Stadium. And I'm just like, wow, I know Babe Ruth didn't play here, but that makes me think of Babe Ruth. And Babe Ruth was, and I'm just doing all this stuff. Well, a pastor friend of mine said, brother, don't fall in love with the city, its sights, and all that it has to offer you. Fall in love with the people of New York City. And my heart broke because I realized I loved the sights and the sounds and what it had to offer me far more than I loved those people. That I was in awe of the city and not in awe of the people. And it was a good correction for my heart. I was willing to use people to build a grand city and appreciate what they built rather than appreciate who God is and what he built. I think you would agree it's easy to be in awe of man-made things. It's easy to marvel at accomplishments in this world. But we who walk by faith, we love people. We value people. We don't use them. We don't use people to get ahead. We bless people for the name of Jesus. So when we walk by faith, we're going to bless and serve. We're going to celebrate. We're going to celebrate other people more than keeping them around because they benefit us. So where this is going is verse 14, knowing that the greatest cities and knowing that the greatest nations will all fall. Verse 14 says, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Babylon didn't last long. It had its moment. 539, God brought her down. And what was once mighty and no one could overcome, God brought them to ruin. And he was glorified in it. And we have to remember that Revelation 17 and 18 talks about the Babylon the Great. And in the last days, God is going to judge and God is going to bring Babylon the Great down to ruin. Speaking of this world, this world economy, this world system, it will all be brought to nothing. And in that day, God, our King, our Christ will be exalted and worshipped above all other people, above all others. He will be the one loved and adored. And on that day, our hearts will be full. Why? Because the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. 
God in His glory will shine farther, wider, and deeper than what we can even conceive of right now. And we, when that moment happens and His glory spreads and bursts, we will finally be at peace. Full peace. And we will finally have our joy capacity exploding now, overflowing joy in the Lord. Do you long for that day? Is that what keeps you going day after day after day when one name is lifted up and one name is known all over this world? And on that day, remember, you and I will be forgotten. And that will be a glorious day when Jesus, the only one who's worthy of worship, will be the only one worshipped. I long for that day. I ache for that day. And don't get me wrong, I love my family and I want to see my family grow up and I want to see them accomplish things in this world. And believe it or not, I want grandchildren and I want to hug them and love them and and spend money I don't have on them or whatever you do with grandkids and just go out of out of my way to dote all over those. grand. I want that. But you know what I want more. I want to see Jesus worshipped. I want to see Jesus exalted. I want to rest in him. And that's what God is saying to Habakkuk. It's coming. Oh, child, don't give in to discouragement today. Don't think sin is prospering and will overcome all things. No, 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 I will. In fact, let's go on to this next piece right here, verses 18 through 20, about this idolatry. I love how this ends. I guess God will work with me and forgive me for not ending the sermon here. But what profit is an idol, verse 18, when its maker has shaped it, a metal image, a teacher of lies? For its maker trusts its own creation when he makes speechless idols. Woe to him who says to a wooden thing, awake, and to a silent thing, arise. Can this teach? Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, and there is no breath in it at all. The, earth is, uh, the, the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Is the silence okay? God has spoken. Is the silence okay? We hate it. We get uncomfortable with it. But that's what the Lord has commanded. And the irony was they made gods. Gods made of their own hands. So-called gods. Made out of wood, covered with silver, covered with gold. And these people were a little frustrated because they would speak to their idol. Say something, do something, arise, get up and help me. And what would that idol say back to them? Nothing. The idol kept silence. And the man who made the idol demanded things from it. You know, good things can be idols, right? It's kind of weird for us to think about carving something out of wood and spending our gold and covering it up. But you know, good things can be idols. Anything that we have to have that we cannot live without is an idol. Anything we cannot release because we treasure Christ more, trust him more, is an idol. I I mean, even our children, sweet, awesome, sinful little rascals, they can be idols. And we're so afraid of releasing them to the Lord. God, you have your way with them. If it means I don't get to raise my grandkids because you call my kids out of here, I trust you. And I love you more than I love that child. And many of us won't go there. So even a good thing, like our family, can be an idol. Money. I think in this part of, of, of the country, um, um, physical. Uh, what, what would that like? Just physical upkeep, our bodies. Goodness, just go to Scottsdale sometime. Nobody's overweight. Go down to Old Town Scottsdale. All these young, fit, beautiful, handsome people. They love themselves. They love their body. They exercise and spend all sorts of money on their body. It can be physical pleasure. It can be traditions. It can be heritage. It can be our plans, our expectations. An idol is anything that we have to have. Anything we cannot and will not live without. Did you know freedom can be an idol? Did you know that? Idol idol offers no real hope. No real guidance. We don't sit silent before them. We sit silent before who? The Lord. You see, our families are good, but they're not God. 
And that's why so many families split up is we've demanded things of them that they can't do. They can't keep. Only God can. And we keep demanding and keep demanding. And we're no different than these Babylonians talking to that wooden statue. Say something. Do something. Come through for me. Help me. And it says nothing back. But we who belong to the Lord, we who walk by faith, sit silent. That's why we devote so much time on Sunday morning to hearing from God. That's why we're so emphatic in calling one another to read the scriptures daily for life change. Because God has spoken. He's not silent. He has spoken. And to the degree that we know his word and we listen and sit long uh, uh, listening to him, we will be conformed into his image. We won't make God into our image. We will be conformed into his image. And so one of the defining marks of living by faith is listening to God, his word. And so the question we need to ask is, are we listening to the idols of our heart or are we listening to the word of the Lord? Who or what voice is loudest in your life? Lord willing, it is the call. It is the word of the great shepherd of the sheep, the Lord Jesus. And we trust him. And what he says is good is good. And we trust him. And what he says is harmful is harmful. And we trust him. What he says blesses, we trust him. What he says ruins, we avoid because we trust him. Brothers, sisters, friends, let me beg you to take it up and read. Take it up and read. Where do you start? I'll just open up tomorrow. Open up this afternoon. I recommend a plan. If you want another plan, I'll share a plan with you, but just read it. Yesterday, we had a moment in our family that was marked by an unwise use of the tongue. And I just gave brief counsel, go read the Bible, pray, and then let's talk. He walked into his room, he grabbed his Bible, he opened up to Ecclesiastes 5, because that's where he was reading in his Bible reading plan, and lo and behold, there were two powerful uh, verses about the tongue and foolishness. And he walked back in, like with his jaw on the ground, can you believe God did that? (laughs) Yes, because that's how God works. And that was a moment of being shaped, that was a, a moment where the Lord rubs some rough edge off and polishes him, forming him into the image. Take it up and read, please. God is not silent. Which we end now with this this thing called drunken violence. Drunk violence, drunken violence, verses 15 through 17. I save this for the end because I believe of all the woes, they're all graphic, uh, they're all startling, but of all the woes, this is by far the most graphic the most startling, the most shameful. And the image, as we read this, is going to be that Babylon has come to town, and they've come to town as your friend, your old drinking buddy. And so, hey, relax, let's just go get, let's go have a drink together and, and talk and, and catch up. But they had, they had wicked motives. Their goal was to get these people drunk, to strip them down and humiliate them. Okay? So when the people were drunk, they struck, they mocked, They stripped them naked. They paraded them around for wicked pleasure. That is, we're reading of pornography here. Verse 15. Woe to him who makes his neighbors drink. You pour out your wrath and make them drunk in order to gaze at their nakedness. You will have your fill of shame instead of glory. Drink yourself and show your uncircumcision. The cup in the Lord's right hand will come upon you. And utter shame will come upon your glory. The violence done to Lebanon will overwhelm you, as will the destruction of the beast that terrified them. For the blood of man and violence to the earth, to cities and all who dwell in them. So this passage here, again, frames it as them coming to town, getting uh, people drunk to, to, to do a ruinous thing, to mock them and shame them and to humiliate them in their nakedness. But the Lord tells us that he has a cup. That these people are going to drink from. And the cup will be marked by shame. Not the pleasure. They thought it was going to bring them pleasure to do this. But all it did was bring shame and ruin. 
But we, the people of the new covenant, we who have read of the crucifixion of Jesus, we know that on the night that the Lord Jesus was betrayed, he's there in the garden and he said, Lord, let this cup pass from me. And we know that when he was crucified, he was stripped naked and he was paraded around for all to see. And so we know it was our Lord Jesus who drank that cup. The cup that we're reading of right here, he drank it. The cup of judgment, the cup of God's wrath. But we know he wasn't an uncircumcised pagan, was he? You just think of Jesus in the contrast of these these five examples. Selfish ambition, he came not uh, not to be served, but to serve. Fear and coveted, no. He is perfect peace. He kept entrusting himself to God. Using people, he blessed people. He celebrated people. The world had used people. He came to set them free. Idolatry, he gave his heart wholly to the Lord. Don't you know it must be about my father's business? In fact, I just quoted Luke. See how relevant it is? (laughs) Drunk in violence? No. He was sober-minded. It says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, was seated. They offered him wine there on the cross? No, he refused it. He's not an uncircumcised pagan. No violence, no blood on his hands, perfectly selfish, fair, honest, gentle, lowly, humble, never exploited, always served. He worshiped the the creator and not the creature. He was the circumcised covenant keeper. He was the fulfiller of God's law. And they saw that. You know why? Because they did strip him naked. And they saw him. And they knew he was not a man of the nations. They knew he was not corrupt and wicked. They saw him. In all of his innocence, in all of his purity, in all of his righteousness. And you know what? Utter shame came upon him. And what God said was coming to Babylon came to Jesus on the day he was crucified in our place. But the greatest irony of it all is while he was being shamed by the wicked, perverted people of this world, he was actually shaming them. He was actually shaming the rulers and powers over this world. He disarmed the rulers and authorities, and he put them to open shame by triumphing over them, Colossians 2, 15 says. So what am I getting at? Brothers and sisters, we are far more Babylonian than we probably can bear to understand in one moment. And there's a cup that we deserve. But Jesus drank that cup for us. And Jesus suffered as though he were a Babylonian. And he's forming us into his likeness because he freed us from Babylon. That's not our heritage. Our heritage is Christ. And so don't walk out of here thinking, I'm just a sinner and sinners are going to sin. Therefore, I guess I'm just bound to do these things until the Lord returns. No, he died for that to free you from that. And you belong to him now. Babylon is not your home and Babylon is not your heritage. Our citizenship is in heaven and from it we await the Savior. So we can admit when we're acting in a way that deserves woe. Because Christ has already suffered for us. He's already been damned for us. He suffered the woe. So don't leave here miserable. Don't leave here beat up, feeling discouraged. Leave here hopeful. Where you see that Babylonian-like instinct, look to the cross and remember it's finished. He's already paid for it. You're free. You're not a slave to that. You're free in Christ. And so I hope you would look to the cross and know that God is just. And the justifier of those who have faith in Christ. So when you remember that God is just and all sin will be addressed, please remember he's also the justifier of sinners. And flee to the cross and call others to join you in fleeing to the cross and hoping in Jesus, the sufficient sacrifice for our sins. And when you trust him, 
you're not alone. You're not alone trying to figure this thing out, how to navigate through these dark days. You have one that's dealing with you as innocent, as free, as righteous. You have one that says, if you lack wisdom, ask and I will generously give it to you without reproach. I'm not going to bring your shortcomings back up. I'm not going to remind you how many times I've shown you wisdom, how many times I've directed your steps. Come on, dense, how long are you going to take? He doesn't talk that way to us. and We shouldn't talk to one another that way. Patient, gentle, humble. Christ has dealt with our sin. Let's address one another according to the righteousness that is ours in Christ. It is finished.